Good morning. It's good to see you here. It's kind of light this morning. I did shower, but um, see, I think I think I recognize all of you. But if this is your first time here, uh, please see to the back seat. Boy, this is a rough morning for me. Apparently, that's why people aren't here. Anyway, in the back of the seat in front of you, there's welcome cards. So if this is your first time here, or if you have any prayer requests, I encourage you to look that over, fill that out. Uh, the elders do look at those prayer requests, and uh, we pray over you. If you have a prayer request that you'd like to share with the whole congregation, I encourage you to use the Faith Life app. And uh, if you haven't done that already, or if you need help with that, please feel free to, to talk to the office. But uh, make sure you're using that for prayer requests. You can find the bulletins in there and schedules and whatnot. So if you have any questions on how to utilize that, please contact one of us. Now, next Sunday is a very important Sunday for us here at Grace. Uh, it is our annual congregational meeting, and we definitely need a good turnout because we are going to be voting on the upcoming budget. Hopefully, we'll have more people next week than I'm seeing here this week. So please encourage those that are not here to come next week because we do have to have a minimum number or a minimum percentage of our active members here in order for the vote to go through. And even more important than... Well, not more important than the meeting, but just as fun as the meeting is that potluck afterwards. So um, <clears throat> there is, there's a sign up at the Welcome Center, so please sign up for a soup or sides and plan on being there next weekend. And that's going to take place of Sunday studies. Um, and let's see here. The last announcement here is ladies. Truth-Filled is a new Bible study opportunity for all, I'm assuming all ladies. Uh, dinner and study will meet for seven sessions bi-monthly from February 15th to May 10th at Carrie Slate's house. Looks like she's not here, but Travis is here. If you want the office to order your book, please submit $10 with your sign-up sheet by January 30th in the Welcome Center slot or offering bag. Are there any other announcements? All right. I'd like to invite the men to come forward while I ask for a blessing. Father God, I thank you for this opportunity this morning to gather together and to worship you, Lord. Lord, you bless us with, with so many gifts each and every day. And, and Lord, I, I ask that you accept these gifts that we offer in return it's a, as a small token um, of our appreciation and love for you, Lord. And I ask that... that this be used to, to further glorify and honor you and to spread the, Lord, the word of your love and, and uh, uh, what you've done for us by sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for our own sins. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. I don't know um, for you guys... Um, this first song we're going to sing, this will be the third time we've done it in church, and I know we did it last week as well. Uh, when we introduce a new song, we like to do it a few times back to back, and then we just sprinkle it in every now and again after we get used to this song. But um, what I like about this song is it talks about the battle belongs to God. It doesn't belong to us. It's, it's not ours to bear. Um, he's the one who fights for us. He's the one who intercedes for us. He's the one who stands for us. And that is such an encouragement to me um, in my times of need and when I'm struggling with things. And just to think about him and his grace and how he is always battling for us and he is always on our side. Please stand as we open our service with Battle Belongs. <laughs>
Well, that was um, fun and interesting for the rest of this time because my music up here disconnected. So I have no music following me anymore. So <laughs> it, it'll be an interesting time for us. Our next song is um, You Never Let Go. And this song talks about um, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the, of the storms of life, you won't. Um, you won't, sorry, turn back. I know you are near. I will fear no evil, for my God is with me. And if my God is with me, whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear? If our God is with us, who are we to fear? You never let go.
Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, but, but God showed his love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Psalms 18, 49 says, For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations, and sing to your name. Psalms 23, 5 through 6 says, You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all of my days, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalms 34 says, Sing praises to the Lord, O you saints, and give thanks to his holy name. Oh, praise the name. Heavenly Father, to sing, 
to lift our voices in, in melody. Oh, God. What a joy, what a privilege. God, thank you for giving us melody to express your many attributes in such a, a glorious way. God, as we come this morning to worship you through our voices, our giving, our fellowship, and God, right now, through your word, we ask that you would be glorified. We ask that you would receive the praise and the glory because, God, you are worthy of it. Lord, I lift up those in our church who are suffering, going through difficult seasons, difficult times. I ask that you would draw close to them. God, I pray that as we, we hear from your word, that your word would be living and active in our hearts, in our minds. And God, we thank you. We thank you for today, for this opportunity. And we ask that you would do a work and we would be sensitive to it. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we're going to dismiss the children up through the third grade for children's church. For the rest of us, we are coming to a close. A close of a very, very long book, a long study. Actually, not that long at all, really. I mean, when you think about it, we started last January in Genesis, and here it is. We're in January of the next year, and we're finishing it up. That's, that's pretty good, okay? Um, so uh, please turn in your Bibles to the book of Genesis, as, as we consider the closing of this chapter and the beginning of another as, as we uh, look ahead next week. I, I love the book of Genesis and the way that it begins. It simply states, in the beginning, God. And today as we come to our passage in chapter 50, we will see how this marvelous book of beginnings concludes. Join with me in chapter 50 as we begin in verse 14. These are the closing words of the book of Genesis. After he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt. He and his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. When Joseph's brothers saw their father was dead, they said, what if? What if Joseph bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong which we did to him? Hmm. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father charged before he died saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, please, Forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin, for they did you wrong. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also came, fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to him, Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God, but God meant it for good in order to bring about the present result, to preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. 
Now Joseph stayed in Egypt, he and his father's household, and Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw the third generation of Ephraim's sons, also the sons of, of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were born on Joseph's knee. Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely take care of you and bring you up from this land to the land which he promised on oath to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones up from here. So Joseph died at the age of 110 years, and he was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. Those are the closing words of this fascinating, powerful book of Genesis. And if you've noticed from the very beginning of this book, in the beginning, God. From the very beginning, this is a book, this is a study about God. I hope you've realized that as we have turned through the pages, through the narrative of, of this book of Genesis. As you turn through the pages of Scripture, this is about God. Think about it. As we have gone through, God is communicating to man. We see God is working in spite of man. We see God continually revealing more and more of himself to man. We see God making promises to man. And as you have turned through the pages of Genesis that span over 2,000 years, think about that. We just went through 2,000 years in less than one year. That's pretty impressive. But as we span over the time of 2,000 years, we see a God that is never changing, who remains consistent, who remains faithful. The pages of Genesis reveal God. They also reveal something about man. As we look at the pages of Genesis, man is consistently turning away from God, is he not? Mankind is constantly, as God is striving to communicate, man is constantly not listening. As rebellious individuals, we, we turn a deaf ear to him. We see that man is falling over and over in sin, constantly failing over and over. How many of you read the pages of Genesis and you're like, wow, we haven't got it yet? Have you begun to get just a little annoyed with yourself? I have. <laughs> to think that it's so crystal clear. Yet, we see failure. We see sin. We see selfishness and man's pride emerge from the pages of Genesis, beginning all the way back in chapter 3. We see nothing but a selfless, humble, gracious God interacting with man. There's one other thing we have seen through the pages of Genesis, through the genealogies that some of you may have read. I did. Man is born, and man consistently dies. There's a pattern here as we look at the narrative of Genesis. There, there's a pattern that emerges about God and there's a pattern that emerges about mankind. And that narrative is still true today, is it not? We, we see this develop throughout the pages, but we see it still this way. 
Man is constantly messing up everything God tries to do. And you and I are just as guilty. But God. But God. I love those two words. Because as man steps into the picture and, and continually interacts with life circumstances, God is continually intervening and, and stepping in. And we read in the pages, but God. But God has a plan. God has a purpose. And you and I, as we come to the pages of Scripture, need to see that plan. We need to understand that purpose and take hold of it. In our passage today, there was two but God moments. I hope you noticed those. And then I've decided to, to look at those. A two-point sermon, by the way. I told Nathan that last night. He's like, whoa, we're going to get out of here quick. I, I, I'm hoping so, because I want to be clear and concise. Two but God moments here. The first one is Joseph's finest hour, and the second is Joseph's final hour. We're going to begin with his final hour, actually. Joseph's final hour. I, I hope as we have looked at the life of Joseph, you have just been amazed with this godly man that we have had the opportunity to look at. A man that in Scripture there is no sin recorded of Joseph. Did you realize that? By the way, not every single year, not every single moment is recorded of Joseph's life. Joseph was a sinner. In need of grace, in need of a Savior. He was not sinless. We just don't have any recorded. But we have looked at this man, a man of integrity, a man of forgiveness. He is an amazing individual to, to look at and, and seek to, to set your life as an example after his example. Yet we see this amazing man in the pages of Scripture die. He too will face death, but did you notice the way that Joseph faced death? Even in the moment of death, he is, he is pointing to someone, to something greater than himself. On his deathbed, there's no words of remember me. There's no words of write in stone my accolades, write about what I did for the land of Egypt. There's none of that. We see a man who's had the opportunity to live an amazing life. He has had children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Generations have been able to be impacted by this man. In his final words to his loved ones is simply this. I will die. I'm going to die. But God... I mean, did you see that? Look at, look at verse 19 with me. I mean, this is just great. But Joseph said to them, don't... Oh, no, not 19, 24. Wrong highlight. There we go. Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die. I've got a little bit of an echo back there. Maybe you want it for emphasis. <laughs> emphasis, emphasis, emphasis. There we go. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God, but God will. I, I love that statement. On his deathbed, Joseph is asking them to focus not on him, not on his death, but focus on God. What a way to die. What powerful words. To focus on God. To focus on the words of God. The promise of God. 
Once again, like his father, he points to what God has promised them to care for them, to comfort. Joseph has lived a powerful life. A powerful testimony. And even in his death, he points to God. He says, God will continue working in your lives. After I am gone, God will continue to work. He's been working since the beginning. And church, listen to this. He still works today. God will continue to work. God will care for you. Imagine his brothers. Imagine the family. They're in the land of Egypt. He said to his family, come here. Come to the good land and I will care for you. And as he passes away, he says, listen, it's not Egypt that will care for you. It's not the Pharaoh. It's not the king. It's not the government. It is God. I think in our day and age, that's a message we still need today. Church, listen. It's not a president. It's not a governor. It's not a, a political group that you and I turn to to care for us, to meet our needs, to give us comfort and peace. It is to God that we look to. Don't ever confuse that. And as, as Joseph is dying, he wants them to remember that. And God will keep His Word. Why? Because God doesn't change. Joseph had seen the steadfastness of his God. I hope through the narrative, through the pages of Genesis, you have seen that as well. I hope, I pray, my final hour in this life points people to God. It's a prayer we should all have. Joseph did. And why wouldn't he? He had lived a life that pointed to God. Think about it. And we see it no clearer picture than in Joseph's finest hour. Point number two. Check it out. We are cruising here, aren't we? But I want you to get the point. Don't expect to have a final hour that is magnificent if there is a life that is not pointing to God. In Joseph's final hour, he points to God because Joseph's life lived a life that demonstrated his finest hour. We see that in, in verses 19 through 21. By the way, you and I are at our greatest. When we are most Christ-like. You and I are at our greatest when we are most like Christ. Think about that. In Joseph's finest hour, we see a man through the hardships of life, the struggles that many of us can relate to, who has come so close to his God that he hears the beating heart. And as he draws close to that heart of his God, he begins to emulate his God. And we see Joseph demonstrate grace. His brothers, on the other hand, begin a thought process that begins with what 
if. How many of you are guilty of saying that phrase, what if, dot, dot, dot? Very seldom does that phrase lead to anything good. It is a phrase that should not come from our mouths often, if at all. What if? Let's assume some things about life. I grew up being told what, um, what happens when we assume. What it makes of me and, and you. Read between the lines there. It's accurate. And his brothers assume something here, don't they? They begin to ponder on the what-ifs of life. Oh, and Satan works in the what-ifs. He stirs the pie. He stirs the church. He stirs that social group, that family. What if? Hmm. These brothers, their father passes away, and they reflect. It's often in our grief that we reflect back on life. And as they're reflecting back, they remember. What if Joseph is holding a grudge? They cannot wrap their minds around this forgiveness that their brother has extended to them. Probably because they're guilty. Right? Guilt has a way of eating away at us. They have not dealt with it yet. They're like, we, we kind of deserve his, his wrath, his grudge. Maybe they're thinking about themselves. Maybe they're thinking about the things they have yet to let go of. And they assume. Did you see Joseph's response? He gets the message. A messenger comes. Not even his brothers. A messenger comes and he weeps. His heart is broken. His poor brothers are still living in this misery. He has extended full grace and forgiveness. There is no bitterness in his heart. Only love and compassion for them. And all they hold on to is this sin in their life. Refusing the forgiveness that has so graciously been extended to them. And you and I can sit here and identify with those brothers, can't we? The faults that we know in our lives, the evils, the sins that, that maybe we are only privy to. And we look at those things and we tell ourselves there's no way that could be forgiven. Did you see Joseph's response? He's not harsh. He could have been. He doesn't use the opportunity to, to bring back the past sins and, and tell them how wrong they were. He doesn't beat them over the head with it again. He doesn't lord his authority over his brothers. I have been convicted by this passage this week. I, I look at Joseph's response to his brothers. And God has convicted my heart of the times as a parent. My children have come to me and said they were sorry about something that they've done. 
And I, as their dad, used the opportunity once again to give a lecture on how bad that was for their life. I used that opportunity to express my concerns, my frustration, my disappointment. And then after all of that, I say, I forgive you. How I've done that with others as well. And what it reveals is a heart that truly has not forgiven. Joseph is compassionate. All he does is strive to calm their fears. Comforts. Did you see those words there? And spoke kindly to them. Church, we could learn something from that. A brother, a sister in Christ comes and says, I am sorry. And we extend comfort. We extend words of kindness, assurance. I find it interesting, he doesn't forgive them here. He's already done that. He just assures them and comforts them. He does say, you meant it for evil. I'll give you that, boys. You meant it for evil, but God. But God, oh, the grace that God had. Joseph had understood that God had a plan. He was willing to hold on to God's plan. He is willing to trust God, not life circumstances. And because of that, because of his faith, he could extend grace. He could extend forgiveness. There was no bitterness in that man's life. Oh, the dangers of a bitter heart. I appreciate what one woman wrote. She writes, do they really matter? All the whys? Could all the answers take away the pain? Were all the reasons really dry my eyes? Though they were from heaven's court, no, I would weep again. My God, you have saved me from hell's black abyss. Oh, save me now from the tyranny of bitterness. The work of forgiveness and extending grace is just as much a work of God in our hearts as salvation. Why did Joseph have no bitterness? Why could he extend forgiveness? Because this man had drawn close to his God. He had seen in his life, he had seen in the life of those before him how God lavishes His grace on you and me. As we read the pages of the narratives of Genesis, sprinkled all over the pages is grace. It's splashed there and it's there and it's stained with grace. As you go through the pages of Scripture, grace flows through like a raging river consuming your sin and mine. God's grace 
And yet, like the brothers, we are so prone to not grabbing hold of it. We are so prone at looking at our hearts and saying, God, I don't deserve it. And pushing His forgiveness, His grace away. News flash. No, you don't deserve His grace. I don't deserve His grace. Grace has been defined, and I love this acronym, God's riches at Christ's expense. Everything God has to offer given to you freely at the cost of His Son, Jesus Christ. That's grace. I don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. That's grace. Grace is defined as, as stooping down Dropping low from a high position. Extending to another what is not deserved. Church, that's grace. The late pastor Donald Barnhouse said it beautifully. Love that goes upward is worship. Love that goes outward is affection. But love that stoops is grace. Picture with me. The heart of God. As I thought about this heart of God that, that beat now within Joseph's heart, able to extend grace, I thought about the heart of my God. One of the most beautiful pictures of the grace that he gave. Imagine she was ripped ripped away from the place of her sin. Drugged through the streets in full disgrace and shame. Hateful words spit upon her. Clothed in nothing but her shame and her guilt. She is thrown at the feet of Jesus. This woman caught in the very act of adultery. Her accusers. Looming over her. Picking up stones over her. Demanding from Jesus. Declaring that the law demands she be stoned to death. What says you, Jesus? Looming over her, waiting for his reply. There she is. In the dust. In her guilt, her shame, her sin. And Jesus, holy, righteous, sinless, stoops down to her level. He says not a word, just coming close to the one Weeping, shameful, trying to hide, but everyone sees. And he writes with his finger in the sand. They demand an answer 
from Jesus. He stoops to her. But he stands to her accusers. He looks them square in the eyes and says, The one without sin shall cast the first stone. Once again, he stoops to the woman caught in sin. Once again, writing in the sand, Scripture never says what is written, what is given. Perhaps as his fingers hold that sand, that clay, he remembers that you and I are but dust. Perhaps he scribbles the words or the letters grace. One by one, the woman and the crowd hear the rocks drop. Starting with the oldest to the youngest, they walk away. The woman left with her shame, her guilt, her sin before Christ. The very one, mind you, who could have picked up the stone. The only one sinless. He gives grace. Our God stooped. For you and I. Our sin. Our shame. Open before him. pull us up. Mark my words, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Speak powerful words. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Not of yourselves, In that moment, the woman had nothing to offer to Jesus Christ. There's nothing we bring to the table to receive grace except our guilt, our shame, our sin. It is a gift, and it's a gift from God. Not as a result of work so that you and I would not boast. Oh, but I will boast in the work of my Savior, Jesus Christ. Joseph's finest hour was when he resembled Christ most. Let that sink in. When Joseph extended grace to his brothers, he resembled Christ the most. You and I today can resemble his brothers. Grace and forgiveness fully extended and given, yet rejecting it because we know the filth of our own sin. Or we can resemble that woman 
who knew her sin, who knew she had nothing to give, nothing that deserved the grace of Jesus Christ, yet freely received it, knowing her need. From the very beginning, God is extending his grace to you and me. That is his plan. Because he knows we don't deserve it. He knows we can't earn it. So he came, he stooped, and he paid the penalty for your sin and mine. It's a gift. And he calls you and I to receive it freely, unmerited. If you haven't done that today, if you in your heart have been receiving His grace like the brothers have, pushing it away, saying, I don't deserve it, I pray today you understand you need it. And with open arms, you freely receive it. And allow Him to embrace you in that passionate, wonderful relationship. That's the message of Genesis. That's the message of the Scriptures. A God who stoops for you and me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, grace, what a gift, what a blessing. So undeserved, and you give it freely at such a huge cost, your son. God, thank you that he has paid what I owed. That we could have a relationship with you. God, my prayer has been this week and this morning. If anyone here today, anyone listening, has not received the gift of your forgiveness for their sin, who has not received the grace that you extend, I pray that today would be the day. God, for those of us who have received that marvelous gift, I pray that we as your children, your church, would extend that graciously, abundantly to those around us. I pray all this in the precious powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Time together with stanzas one, two, and four of Sunshine in My Soul, 747.
are dismissed. Let that sunshine in your soul shine bright.